Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Humid Climate Conference. Back in 2015, the Austin chapter of Passive House Alliance US was thinking about how to get more attention to the FIAS Plus 2015 standard in humid climates. And so the thought emerged, what if we put on a conference? I'm proud to tell you that this is an unmissable conference. It's a unique gathering of the best building science minds who are ready to talk seriously about passive house and humid climates. This event is entirely volunteer organized, supported by Passive House Institute US, and sponsored by some of the best product manufacturers and industry consultants in the country. And it's sold out in its first try. But it's happening again this year, May 21st and 22nd, with a great speaker lineup. We're talking Joe Stebrick, Lou Harriman, Richard Corsi, Matthew Tanteri, and the list literally goes on and on and on. Find out more at humidclimateconference.org. Early bird tickets are limited and they're selling quickly, so don't miss out and be left wondering. Register today. That's humidclimateconference.org for tickets. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to this. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Building Science to the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin. Texas. Hello, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin. Thank you guys for listening. Today we are talking about the secret life of concrete. And I am here with uh, Matt Carlton and Lee Lawrence, both from WJE. We're just going to jump right in. Matt, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, this is Matt Carlton with Wish Janie Elstner. I'm a principal here and manager of the Austin office. This is Lee Lawrence with WJE, or Wish Janie Elstner Associates. And I'm a principal in the company and director of our practice development function. Fantastic. And what you guys might not know about WJE is that they are concrete experts, to say the least. They have a lab here as well as an engineering practice. And I'm just back from the ASHRAE conference in Chicago, and I can tell you that our world, whether you realize it or not, those downtowns, they are often canyons of concrete, glass, and steel. So concrete is used all over our world, our, the built world, I mean, not just in buildings. And yet, personally actually uh, and I think probably a lot of you listening we don't know all that much about it it's kind of goes invisible it just there it is it's concrete yeah it must be whatever it is and so the goal of this episode is to help you guys uh, get a deeper understanding uh, for what concrete is and appreciate what it is just to make it so when you walk around the world it's more interesting to you because you know it better so either one of you guys let's let's just start this out how about we start out with something about concrete that people might not know Concrete, Christoph, is, it's a more complicated material than most people realize. I remember when I decided to go to graduate school, I told my parents I was going to go get a master's degree and I'd be studying concrete. And they just, <laughs> my dad just kind of scratched his head and it's like, son, it's, it's gray and it gets hard and it makes sidewalks out of it. What, what more do you need to know? But actually, concrete is way more complicated than people realize. In the United States every year, That's great. We, we make about 260 million cubic yards of concrete. That's just the ready-mix concrete. Moly. That's just the stuff going down the road in trucks, not, not counting the precast concrete. And there's plenty of that, too. So 260 million, million cubic yards is about 77 great pyramids of Giza. Oh, my gosh. Of volume of concrete. I was trying to think of how to put that in context. Oh my gosh, 77 pyramids of Giza. Just a, just a huge volume of material. Wait, and and that was annually, you said? Yeah, that's every year. That's mind blowing. Oh, and, that, and that's in the US alone. Correct. Yeah. Wow. The world, worldwide production of Portland cement used to make concrete is over 19 billion tons a year. Oh my so it's a major part of the built world that we live in every day. Yeah, it's uh, the resources that go into it are, are an important thing to think about, and the the fact that we we're frankly we're just incredibly dependent on concrete as a construction material because we make our roads mm-hmm. out of it, we make our bridges, buildings, dams, just about all civil infrastructure. That's another thing that's it's easy to overlook, mm-hmm. but you know where your water comes from 
where your waste goes to. Oh, that's all concrete. Concrete structures form the backbone of infrastructure in this country. That's right on, yeah. We are heavily addicted to this material. <laughs> and it is quite ubiquitous or used throughout the world, every, wow. every country in the world. So just in, in an average building, right? So an average like um, multifamily or downtown office building, Concrete's obviously used in the piers, in the foundation. The whole structure can be concrete as well, right? Or concrete and rebar. Absolutely, yeah. Buildings can have entire concrete, uh, of course, concrete framework and, and complete concrete exterior uh, enclosures. Foundations, building frames, slabs, wall elements, the parking lot, the sidewalks, mm -hmm. swimming pools. The sewer system leading to it, the That's water right. mains leading to it, leading from it. Wow. So before we go too much farther, could one of you tell me what, or tell us what concrete is? Well, concrete, concrete comes in a lot of different forms, but what we're primarily focusing on here today is what we refer to commonly as Portland cement concrete. But concrete is, is simply a binder um, and filler materials. And for the kind of concrete, the construction material that we're talking about, Portland cement concrete, it's a, it's a hydraulic cement. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the filler materials um, are aggregates. So and binder to, and filler materials, those to are be, the two To be categories. clear, what, what the rest of the country calls cement in Texas, we call cement. <laughs> <laughs> just cement. a little bit of Texan, Texan to translation. <laughs> cement. I'm, fi I'm fixing to get it right. That's right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a binder and it's a filler material. The those, binder, those two things make yeah, concrete. That's right. And, and for, for, um, for Portland cement, concrete um, we use we use the cement we use aggregates and we use water and admixtures and the water is used to to allow the chemical reaction to occur within the cement and so the, the water mixes with the Portland cement that's and correct the reaction and there's there. a chemical reaction that occurs that ultimately makes it get hard and there's admixtures, and admixtures are primarily used to um, to modify, control the what we refer to as the rheological properties of the concrete. Rheological? Yeah. That's like RH. RH. And what does that mean? That's that's the uh, put it in more common terms, the workability. Uh -huh. The uh, concrete needs to be. Uh, such a fluid state that we can manipulate it, we can mm -hmm. move it easily, we can mm -hmm. place it, consolidate it, and finish it. Mm -hmm. They used to do that just by adjusting the amount of water in the concrete, which, but that's very limiting when you're trying to make high strength concrete. Because that um, impacts the strength. Right, because there's a, a very small portion of that water is actually used in the hydration process, uh, and that's that process, that chemical reaction. Um, the rest of it is what we call water of convenience. So that's just water that helps make it into a flowable mixture. Interesting. Water of convenience. I like that term. So I want to go a little bit, little bit down deeper into the rabbit hole here. What, what is the hydration process? What is the chemical reaction? Try to keep it relatively simple if possible. Portland cement is comprised of, if, if we break it down, it's it's a combination of um, calcium, aluminate, and silicates. And, and those components come together through the raw materials that we, that we bring together and in effect burn through the kiln process. It's a big oven, so you use them, uh, materials like limestone and clays mm. um, to- and You um, cook them. You cook them and, and it, it, it breaks them down. And when you have the, um, Calcium, aluminate, and silicates coming together, coming back together in the presence of moisture, you get what we call the CAS hydrate. Okay. Uh, for uh, for and that CA is for calcium, and S is for silicate, silicate, and A for aluminates. I get it. In real simple terms, those those ingredients that Lee mentioned, they come from limestone, they come from clay. When you heat them up and you add energy to them, you're driving off carbon and oxygen and hydrogen from those molecules and when you mix them back when you grind that up into a fine powder and you add water back to it it's getting the hydrogen and the oxygen back and it reverses mm. it's like a reversible reaction basically so you put heat in you drive off those elements 
you put the water back in and it will recombine and try to go back to the state that it was in before. Hmm. And that's a, what they call in chemistry an exothermic reaction. So when you have concrete, uh, you, you will actually notice if you go up and you are where you can put your hand on the side of some formwork for some concrete that's been placed, particularly if it's a big element, it, it's quite warm. And wow. managing that heat is one of the things that we have to do in the construction process. If you have a massive piece of concrete, it can get too hot and actually cause some, some issues with it. I didn't know that. So roughly what temperature would a form be on a big element like you're saying? Like it, 90 degrees, 80 degrees? It's completely dependent on the, the size of the element and how rich the mix is, how much Portland cement is in there. Hmm. But you can easily get temperatures. When I was in graduate school, we measured temperatures of massive U block, uh, massive end blocks at the ends of these u-shaped beams that were being cast for bridges mm -hmm. and those were roughly five foot or so thick yep lee was involved in that he was reviewing the research project that i was on when i was in in, in, in uh really? in graduate school uh but uh those would easily get up over 200 degrees oh man you mean hot yeah and, and that can be an issue because it can cause some bad reactions in the concrete, and then it can also cause thermal cracking just due to the volume changes as it's trying to, uh, you have differential cooling and differential volume changes between the exterior and the interior of the mass. Yeah. Most, most modern day specifications try to limit um, the temperature that the concrete elements get to, to some maximum temperature uh, to help mitigate the potential for these bad actors, these bad potential um, chemical reactions that can occur as well as the, the thermal um, uh, differential between the element and the outside mm -hmm. environment that can lead to cracking. Wow. So it's clear it's complicated and yet it's pretty much figured out. Like generally speaking on a project by project basis, you don't get stumped on how to approach a given design element, right? It's figured out. Well, well we, we know a lot about the industry's you know knows a lot about concrete but it's also an industry that's constantly evolving hmm. oh, there, there are different materials being brought into the market um, oh, really there are different factors that affect the concrete concrete industry transportation costs um, material oh, right. availability um, mm -hmm. whenever people have a waste pro byproduct that they want to get rid of one of the things they often think of is can we find a way to put this in concrete <laughs> And Jimmy Hoffa found some good stuff to put in concrete. <laughs> so before we go to, to that, I wanted to, I do want to talk about different types of concrete. But So I, it occurs to me that we didn't talk about, like, so it's complicated and we as a society generally have mostly figured out how to get concrete to behave the way we want to. But how long has it been used? I mean, when did human beings first start making concrete? Or, by, and when I ask that question, I don't mean necessarily a Portland cement concrete. Just right. Yeah. Binders and filler material. Yeah, the modern day port Portland cement is, is a much newer material, but you know, concrete in one form or another has, has been used for over 2,000 years. It goes back to the really? the Romans, and, and there's there's a lot of structures that the Romans constructed that are still um, here today with us you know, that were made out of concrete. The Pantheon is one of the most recognizable structures that's uh -huh. made out of concrete that's still around. I can see that in my mind's eye. That's, those aren't stacked up limestone blocks? Right. No, they, they actually formed it and all those sort of um, recessed, uh, it's got a sort of a coffered dome uh -huh. is what it is with a big with a big hole in the roof and and uh, they formed all that up and, and, and made it out of concrete. Whoa! The Pantheon is concrete? Yeah. I did not know that. The remnants, the remnants of uh, Roman aqueducts, roads, buildings, ports. They use it a lot um, in marine environments, you know, placed it underwater. Salt yeah. water? Yep. And can it? Can the chemical reaction work with salt water? Or is it inert to salt water? Has it? It, it doesn't affect the You can't the control actual, the yeah. water mix it, if you're putting it in salt water. Well, that is, so like one of the real distinguishing factors of a hydraulic cement is that it doesn't get strong by drying, it gets strong by that hydration process that we talked about. And that works as well underwater as it does in the air. You have to be careful that you, that it doesn't get dissolved in the water. Mm -hmm. And so if we're placing concrete underwater nowadays, we'll put some extra admixtures in there to kind of make make it stick together a little better underwater so it doesn't get washed away. Hmm. Uh, and it's the way that you place it, you have to be careful about that. But yeah, that was 
Um, that was one of the things that uh, the Romans discovered was that, like, if you just use lime, if you just take limestone and burn the limestone, mm-hmm. you can come up with a hydraulic lime. And that same material has been used by masons, you know, there was, a, there was kind of a, a, in the dark ages, the secrets of making hydraulic cement were kind of lost. Uh, after the fall of Rome and kind of getting into med- medieval Europe, they kind, of, they kind of lost that art. And then it was back in the, the mid-1700s that that was rediscovered, exactly how to make a hydraulic cement that would get hard underwater. That burned lime mortar, it, doesn't, it will not get hard underwater because it really kind of relies on drying to get that initial strength. Mm-hmm. So bridges, roads, buildings, back in Rome 2,000 years ago. Yeah, and, and what the Romans did was they, they learned how to make lime by burning limestone. So they would burn the limestone at temperatures ranging up to about 1,600 degrees F. And then they would take that lime product and they would mix it with uh, volcanic ash. And in the combination of those two ingredients created uh, the concrete that we know, um, you know that the Romans produced. And it was, it was a, um, actually it's proven to be a very durable, high quality material. Now, I like that. So the, the, the volcanic ash, was that a filler material and any filler material might have worked? They just had ash around? Or was there something about no, the ash that was... In, in that case, the, the, the volcanic ash really wasn't considered a, a filler material like, like aggregates are. It, it was a supplemental material to go in with the lime that contributed to the hydration process. And so in, in that case, and it's what we refer to as pozzolonic materials. And, and, and we say it again, pozzolonic materials. And the name comes from the village of Pozzuli which was near, it was just uh, down from Mount Vesuvius. It got its name from the volcanic ash that the Romans mined from um, Pozzuoli, which is close to Mount Vesuvius. And in that material, um, you know, in, in essence, what happened was the volcano did the work of what our modern day kilns ah. do. So it, 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 it took the material from the earth, right. it heated it up, turned it into a molten material, and it combined and then it cooled. And then the Romans would take that material, they'd grind it up, add it with the lime, and in the presence of the lime and then water, it would form a, a hydraulic concrete. And, um, and it's proven to be a, a very durable concrete. Now, that's gonna vary with the quality of the volcanic ash that's used. And that particular ash from um, nearby um, town of Pozzuoli, was a particularly good ash. Not all volcanic materials are made the same. And, and so some are better than others. And so what you see is like as, as various um, communities around the world would try to make something like concrete, the quality of what they got, because they didn't really know the elements that were going into it and mm-hmm. what they needed to be looking for, they would dig you know their limestone or whatever materials they had out of the ground and they would cook them and they would get some material of variable quality but it wasn't really until <laughs> you know the, the getting into the mid 1700s and the 1800s that people started to understand a little better what they needed to go look for and dig out of the ground mm-hmm. and cook in order to, to make a better cement mm-hmm. and I'm just thinking about the structures I'm still stuck back in Rome the so the ash first of all it, that they use this from Pazuli, it's both part of the chemical reaction and a filler material, or is there? Did they add some other filler material? Well, they it's still it, had aggregates. They yeah. still had aggregates. Yeah, well, still had in the, I would guess um, in 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 looking at some of the Roman concretes, the volcanic ash served both purposes because they couldn't. They wouldn't grind it fine mm-hmm. enough to where it would completely become part of the hydration product. You would have larger chunks ah, in it, which would sense. serve as a film material or an, or an aggregate. Okay, and tied into that is, um, you know, the the so mo- in the modern concrete when we use it for structures, we do rebar, we reinforce it with something. Was there something equivalent? Back in the Roman times, did they put no, like not wood back in then. it or rope in it? Or well, no? they used to use, in, in some applications, like in plasters and things, they used to mix in animal hair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> horse right. hair and hog hair and things. 
in concrete. But structure, that's not structure. Well, it's surface it's not, structure. Well, it kind of helps keep it, keep it from shrinking. and uh, Well, it helps control stresses from shrinking and things. It, it wouldn't help in terms of like really well, resisting does. structural loads. It doesn't do the same thing as rebar. That was in the mid-1800s that people discovered you could put steel on concrete and do more things. The, the Romans really designed, you know, that, that concept of the arch. That's a structure, all concrete. Mm -hmm. It spreads the load to ground. Through exactly. Itself. Masonry and concrete, that, those types of materials are strong in compression and weak in tension. So you can either design your structures so that they, trans, they carry all the load to the ground through compression, which is kind of like the classic arch. And when you see, you know, examples like flying buttresses in cathedrals in Europe from, you know, Gothic times, they were able to do incredible things with materials like that that were really just good for compression. But they had to do these extravagant, if you know what a flying buttress is, they had to do these extravagant mm -hmm. architectural features in order to take that force and transfer it down to the ground purely through compression. Right. And so when you have steel, that means that you can design your structures differently. You can design a beam. You mm -hmm. can't really design mm -hmm. a beam out of pure concrete that will carry much load because on the bottom of a beam, you always have, well, you know, if you just think of a, of a two by four put between two saw horses and somebody's sitting on it, mm -hmm. you get tension on the bottom and compression on the top. And the tension is a problem. Tension is a problem for concrete. Compression is really, it's, it's really very strong in compression. So when you put that piece of rebar in there, what it is doing is it is taking the tension that the concrete can't take. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the two together, it's, it's a, it was the earliest composite material, mm -hmm. really, from a structural standpoint. Nowadays we have composites using fiber reinforced polymers and things like that. But concrete was truly one of the first composite building materials using the strengths of steel in tension and of concrete in compression. The, the, the Romans were, I would say probably the initial driving force was to have a material that they could build their aqueducts out of mm -hmm. that would not erode away from the water. Mm -hmm. And so hydraulic cement was really important for yeah. that. And so that, that was the primary focus and then, and then it, it grew into other, other uses. Wow, so cool. So the jumping forward past the Dark Ages now, mid-1700s you were saying, it started to get more formalized, more predictable, more, uh, I guess, like quality control. Is that when the rebar went in? Did they? So yeah, just to kind of back up a little bit, yeah, one, of the, one of the landmarks in, in civil engineering and the development of concrete was back in the mid-1700s when there was a lighthouse off the coast of Cornwall, England. Huh. that because of the particular tides in that area, when the ocean would come in, it would wash across the base of this lighthouse and it would erode out that lime, that old school lime mortar that I was telling you about, because it, it, it can be eroded and, and washed out. And that's more like a physical force that was happening, causing erosion, or was it a chemical force? Chemical. Uh, both. Both, because... It would dissolve the mortar. It would dissolve, okay. the, it was not a hydraulic okay. mortar, and it would actually dissolve it out. And that wave action, would yeah, wash it out of scouring them in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> exactly. And so after about 30 years, this lighthouse would, you know, they would have to rebuild it at about every 30 years because of that wave action. And at sometime in the mid 1700s, the king or whoever there in England said, look, I need somebody that can figure out how to build this thing so it lasts longer than 30 years. And um, one of the first guys to <laughs> ever, one of the first guys to ever style himself as a civil engineer, his name was John Smeaton, he went and did a whole bunch of research on how he could make better mortar. And so he took all those raw materials like I was describing right. and he tried different limestones and, and really kind of went through the first process to find the best materials. And when he made a hydraulic mortar that could be used for rebuilding that lighthouse, it lasted for almost 130 years before they replaced it with a more modern structure. Awesome, and they found other things to do with that. Recipe exactly. So <laughs> then, once that kind of knowledge had been regained, other folks took it and built on it. And the name Portland cement comes from a guy named Joseph Aspden, who was in Leeds, England, and he all went through a process where he kind of refined the selection of materials and the the, the process of heating it up in a kiln. Fascinating. And what the product that he produced looked it had this gray surface gray finish and it looked similar to a kind of stone that was quarried near portland england and so that's where the name portland cement really? comes from yeah i always wondered about that today 
We have, in the United States, mainly Portland-based cement. And we use it for all kinds of different purposes in our buildings, and not just in our buildings. But how about, could, could one of you kind of list some of the typical applications of Portland cement in the United States? Or? Well, let, let, let's, start, let's start with its with the advent of its use in the United States. Let's that, start with that. That really um, started coming into fairly frequent use in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, um, okay. and there was somewhat of a cottage industry that, that developed around um, structural engineers that would design structures out of concrete. And so they're very proprietary designs. Were they designing forts? Somehow that comes to mind for me. Like hard to put a cannonball through a big concrete wall. There was some of that, but also just uh, there was a big trend. So you know, before that, they used to build buildings out of wood, mm-hmm. and fires were a terrible oh, issue. Oh yeah. And so you'll see, you know, if you go around, in particular in Texas, we work on um, historic courthouses and things, and you'll see like back when they were advertising in the day, they would say we replaced our old burn, our, the old wood courthouse burned down, and we built a new fireproof courthouse and so concrete structures were really billed as being much safer than wood because they wouldn't burn wow yeah so you would that's right you'd build a large component of the structure out of out of concrete as we talked about earlier you know the the frames and if you had masonry for the cladding even uh, uh, a portland-based mortar for the plaster on the inside walls and so that, that would make them far less susceptible to, to fire damage. And, and it was interesting, if you go back and, and look at the historic concrete in, in the U.S. From, from that time period, one, one thing you found was that uh, they, were, uh, they were very ingenious in, in how they made their concrete, and they were very green. They, they recycled anything and everything. And so we would find in historic concrete all different types of aggregates the filler materials that we talked about mm-hmm, earlier, mm-hmm. Uh, very frequently they would use um, crushed brick. So there were, you know, brick had been used for for quite some time at that point, and so buildings would get demolished, and and, and the leftover brick wouldn't be wasted. It would be crushed up and used as aggregate and concrete. Is that was that fully legit? I mean, would you do that today, or is brick not a good aggregate? Well, it can it can be a good aggregate. It just depends on the use mm-hmm. use of the concrete. And so, one thing we pay particular attention to today is the quality of the materials that are used to make the concrete to make sure that they're going to have a long service life and they're not going to be susceptible to certain types of, of deterioration. Um, but um, a lot of the concrete made with with brick as as the aggregate or filler materials, um, a lot of it's still around today. Okay, good. So. That was how concrete got its start. It got its start by uh, it didn't burn down. Um, but how about you catch us up? Tell us about modern concrete. Well, from from the early 1900s up until probably probably get this a little wrong, but generally speaking, maybe in, into the 70s, there's a there's a long period of time there where concrete technology didn't change significantly, at least at the rate that we've seen it change in, in the last 30 or 40 years. The materials years. of concrete. The materials of yeah. the, and, and the, the materials used for making the concrete. And, uh, and, and, and the concrete mixes were relatively simple. It was Portland cement, aggregate, and water. Uh, and, and, you know, later on in, in probably starting in the, uh, in, the, in the 50s or 60s, some admixtures started um, coming into use, but it really wasn't until we got a little bit further, um, closer into the 70s, that we really started seeing the, the pro- proliferation of a lot of different admixtures that had profound impacts mm-hmm. on the properties of concrete and what we can do with concretes that lead into what I refer to as, as, as our modern day concretes. Uh, wow. that we used to why don't you touch on the strength like the evolution of concrete strength over that time period yeah and and so if 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 we go back to when we were talking about the um the early 1900s you know if if you were if you were getting two or three thousand psi concrete strength concrete compressive strength concrete on a consistent basis you were doing pretty well hmm. two or three thousand PSI. yeah that that, that would have, that would have been fairly fairly commonplace and, and certainly there, there there would have been times where 
Uh, you could have gotten better depending on the quality of the aggregates, how much water you use and everything else. But we've looked at a lot of historic structures over the years and sampled the concrete and tested them. And one thing that we found was that, very indicative of those concretes, was that the, the strengths varied a lot because the quality control varied a lot. Right. And, um, and then as we moved through time, quality control got better, the, the, the use of higher quality materials, such as higher quality aggregates, um, became better and so the quality of concrete started um, really increasing during that time period and, and um, at some point in time primarily associated with the advent of better quality Portland cements and the admixtures that we've, we've talked about uh, that, that came into use. Um, the potential for, for increasing the strength of concrete just, just blew through the roof. Wow. Uh, and so we went, we went from a period of time where three, four, five thousand PSI concrete was kind of very commonplace and then it crept up and, and we started um, seeing where we could get concretes pushing up to 10,000 PSI. Today, uh, as we'll, we'll probably talk about here in a little bit, um, some of the, the, the most modern day concretes that are, that are being developed and starting to come into some use now, um, pushing concrete strengths of 30,000 PSI. Wow. And, and this effectively changes the, the palette of colors that an architect can push the envelope with. They can do different structures because of those different properties. Is that right? Well, you know, as the, the, the actual structural systems that we use, so the materials is, is okay. one so aspect of the, the concrete, lead. right? Yeah. The structural systems that we use also are very heavily dependent on the strength of the concrete. And what you can do with it is dependent on the strength of the concrete. Mm -hmm. Those structural systems have evolved over time as well. And so if you go back to what Lee was talking about, the very first systems that they used to use, those first warehouses and courthouses and things, they didn't, analytically, they didn't have very good tools for understanding the stresses in the concrete. And so they would build things and then load test them. They would actually put weight on them. They would proof test it. And uh, Lee described those guys as engineers. I mean, they were kind of self-titled engineers. He's using, uh, air, I'm using air, air quotes. quotes. <laughs> they were self-titled engineers and they would come up with these proprietary systems where they, you know, I would invent Matt Carlson's rebar layout and then I would patent it. They would actually patent those things. Um, and the only way they had to figure out how strong they were was to actually load them up. And then so over time, the, the science of structural engineering has developed, the, the ability to analyze structures numerically rather than having to build it. Obviously, it's pretty, if, if you build it and load test it, it falls down, <laughs> you're out a lot of money, right? It's way better to go through that process on paper right. and then figure out what's going to work. That's, that is engineering. And um, so those systems have evolved over time, different technologies have developed for reinforcing the concrete and maximizing the efficiency of, um, of the structures built out of concrete. And so things like pre-stressing were, were developed where you, and you, you go a step beyond just putting a passive unstressed piece of rebar in the concrete that only gets utilized when the concrete cracks. Um, if you pre-stress concrete, you take some piece of steel and you stretch it, then you place the concrete and when that steel um, wants to go back to its original shape, it pre-compresses the concrete. Whoa. So before you can crack the concrete, you have to overcome all of that pre-compression pre that you put in there to begin with. And so that, like your typical highway bridge, is made out of pre-stressed girders. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason those girders can be far thinner and span longer distances than a conventionally reinforced beam mm -hmm. would, would require. Mm -hmm. And they, the staying at the bridge curves for a minute, they have like a camber to them, they have a curve to them, slight arc to them. They do. Is that like a bridge loading, like an arch kind of thing that's, um, is it a force vectors going through the arch that's important or is it this pre-stressing that's happening there? It's the latter actually, uh, It's yeah. and it, we call it camber and it's a byproduct of the pre-tensioning pre process when you, when you do that, if you can imagine taking any compressible item and you squish it on one side, it tends to get, it gets shorter on that side and that will cause a curve in it. And so that's what those, the camber in those girders is caused by the pre-stressing. Wow, fascinating. Okay, stay with me here because I'm, I'm gonna go down to probably a few levels, but as a residential builder, I was often presented the choice between um, post-tensioned slabs and re rebar reinforced slabs. Mm -hmm. And I usually chose rebar but what would you recommend? What should I have chosen? 
It depends on your site. Um, oh, okay. The advantage of, pre- of post-tension slabs, the, the uh, post-tensioning is a little different than the bridge girders. You know, in post-tensioning, you've got cables with plastic sheathing and mm-hmm. the concrete You pull tight at the end. And you put a hydraulic ram on it and you, you compress it. Um, it's it, gym, the, it was developed because of the labor savings. Instead of putting a reinforcing bar every 12 inches on center or, or uh, wire mesh in there, You've got cables on the order of every four feet on hmm. center mm-hmm. and a post tension foundation. So it ends up with equivalent strength or structural strength. That's the idea: is that you're you get this you know a foundation that can resist the loads. You've got less steel and less labor. So mm-hmm. that's the idea. Um, there are situations where a conventionally reinforced slab might work better. Um, if you're on a hillside in limestone in Central Texas, anytime you're digging the foundation into rock, the 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 foundation can get locked into the rock. And so if you try to post tension it and pull it together, it's not coming together. It's it's anchored to the rock. Right. And uh. so in that kind of application, it's called restraint. If you have a highly restrained uh, situation, then it may not make sense to try to post tension your foundation. If yeah, post tensioning is more suited for simpler geometries where you can have you can efficiently use the post tension tendons, mm-hmm. you know, rectangular shapes, things like that. When you get into more complex or smaller geometries, sometimes it just makes better sense to use vinyl That's reinforcement. Right. And so you mentioned the if you hit in limestone, you'd want to stick with three bar reinforced. What if it's on clay? I mean, high, like highly expansive soils. Is that a good reason to go toward post tension, or is it, again either one? Uh, either one can work, and, and post tensioning. The, the post tensioning institute has actually um, they've got detailed procedures on how to do evaluations of foundations in clay and how to design those properly. And so they were really one of the groups that was out there at the forefront of of trying to understand how um, foundations perform in clay and to engineer those properly. So yeah, you can you can definitely do a post tension foundation in clay soils. Okay, all right. Thank you for letting me interject that. So back to you, Lee. You you were going through modern concrete and you were saying about that there were some additives that started to come into the concrete to make it modern. Yeah, there's 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 a variety of admixtures. There's a Ad large mixtures, you're saying. variety of admixtures, and then there's um, um, additives or supplemental materials that can be used to replace uh, the Portland cement, uh, to add to or replace portions of the Portland really? cement. And, and one of the best examples of that would be um, fly ash, which is a byproduct of the coal burning process. So when you burn coal, you have certain materials that go up in the flue gases, and those materials are captured through, through different filter systems. And, and those materials are very high in what we refer to as reactive silica. Mm. And remember the, mm. the, the what volcanoes. we talked earlier about, we got calcium, aluminates, and silicates are, are the primary ingredients in Portland cement or the binder for, for concrete, be it materials being made in, in modern day right. kilns or right. by volcanoes. Those are the key elements that, that, that come together and, and create a hydration product um, uh, that works for, for concrete. So reactive silica coming in in the form of fly ash um, will react well with the byproducts of the Portland cement hydration products and add to it. And, and so that's one example. And we're generating it anyway. We don't know what to do with it. Yeah, it's, they used to it, put it in landfills. That's before. right. It's, huh. it's a, it, it was a waste product and, and then they discovered, um, uh, I guess probably in the late, um, early to late 50s, uh, that that this material could work in concrete. It really started becoming um, much more popular in use in the, in the late 60s or early 70s. Uh, and today, uh, it's at least here in Texas, it's a challenge to buy concrete that doesn't have fly ash in it. There are actually fly ash shortages. I was about to ask because people the it, grid mix is shifting away from coal. Right, exactly because you know the, it has great properties uh, for concrete. It was this great serendipitous thing that fly ash came along and yeah. uh, and and it worked nice great. Synergy. It was a waste material and it made better concrete. And uh, but now um, that we've just gotten really addicted to fly ash in our concrete. <laughs> They they're they're turning off the tap because coal Darn is, solar is, panels and people are going away from frackers. Coal, so. but fly, fly ash, fly ash was an interesting, interesting material because it contributed to the um, 
to the binder, as we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it also, because the fly ash particles are very small spheres, they act almost like a lubricant, lubricant to the concrete. They're that like little ball bearings. Spheres. And so they affect the rheology, rheology of the concrete, the workability of it. And so oh. in theory, in most cases, when you add fly ash, you can reduce a little bit of the water content that you would otherwise need that what Matt referred to as the water of convenience to give you the workability you need mm -hmm. to place it. Fly ash can help you take some water reductions, which in concrete is good because we only need a fraction of the total amount of water we put into it to really properly hydrate uh, the binder. The rest of it is extra water that stays in the concrete, creates a capillary or pore system that in essence weakens the concrete, makes it less strong, makes it less durable. So fly has had a lot of really good benefits and as Matt said, uh, the challenge now is that we're not burning as much coal, uh, that, that, that shortages of fly ash are, are starting to become a concern. And so hmm. in addition to the fly ash, we have other admixtures that can enhance the properties of the concrete in a lot of different ways. We have we have materials that can uh, do what we call um, entrain air into the concrete, air entraining admixtures. Hmm. And the idea there is that makes the concrete more durable to cyclic freezing and thawing conditions under wet conditions. When the concrete saturated wet and it freezes, the volumetric expansion of the water uh, has is, a place to is go. quite large and, and it creates high, high stresses and it can deteriorate the concrete, crack it up. Uh, so air and training admixtures, then we have materials that enhance the workability, uh, which we uh, refer to as um, uh, mid and high range uh, water reducers and plasticizers. Wow. And so those materials can allow you to reduce the amount of water that you need, but still give you the same workability or maybe in, even improve workability. And then another family of very common admixtures um, are admixtures that retard the set. Of the, of, the, of the binder, of the Portland cement, or the, um, or the Portland cement and fly ash combination. And uh, those, those materials can give you longer working times or delivery times for the concrete to where they don't set quite as quickly. It would be, it's a Why would that be important? Well, so co concrete sets, one of the factors that controls how long it takes for concrete to set is the temperature. Uh, if you're playing, placing concrete on a hot day, you have much less time to work with it. So it's a real challenge in Central Texas to place concrete in the summer without some sort of retarder, particularly if you're a truck stuck, stuck out here on 183 trying oh, to make it right. to a job site. Yeah, let's say the, the oh, nearest batch right. plant is an hour away. Well, and maybe you've got an hour and a half or two hours before that concrete starts, starts, starts to set, the, the, the binder, the cement starts to its initial setting process, you start losing those workability properties. And, and so setting time for most concretes are generally speaking without any admixtures are gonna be in the two to three hour range. Wow. And so if you got long transit times, you're cutting into that time that you have to get the concrete out of the truck, placed, consolidated, and, and finished before it sets. And, and so those admixtures, particularly in hot environments because the hydration process is a chemical process, and what we learned in high school with chemical processes, they're generally accelerated by heat. Right. So the hotter it is, the faster they go. Fascinating. So related to the trucks on the road, I'm envisioning like a discretized pipeline of concrete coming from a plant to the site. Is it ever the case that the site would need so much concrete it would make sense to put the plant near the site or on the site? Yeah, they can set up small batch, like uh, portable batch plants if they're hmm. doing something like building a runway or a dam mm -hmm. where they're going to need huge volumes of concrete, then they might actually set up a small batch plant on site. That's or if it's or out in the middle of nowhere. Batch plant on site. <laughs> yeah, or if it's in the middle of nowhere where there's just no nearby oh, batch right. plant. It's very common. That's really neat. Now, I've often uh, I don't know why, but for some reason I'm downtown, I look at this giant skyscraper, and then I get out in the middle of nowhere and I think, this is where they ought to build a skyscraper. It would be so much more impressive out here with nothing around. Right. But of course, they don't have access to resources. So that the planning process, the logistics of ensuring the continuous concrete supply on a massive pour, like we were, work, we were working on a project of a high-rise project downtown, and it has a mat foundation under the building, which is on the order of uh, seven to 10 feet thick. 
and it's the entire footprint of the oh building. My God. And so they pour those things. When they start, they don't stop. And the, they'll, they're placing concrete continuously for 24 or 36 hours until they're done because they don't want what's called a cold joint in the concrete. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, it's, it's, uh, you've it's got high, have, high stakes. It is high stakes. They've got uh, all of the batch plants. They probably have more than one plant supplying concrete to the site in case they have a breakdown. Logistically, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. There ought to be a reality TV show on that. I'm sure it's going to be channel probably next week. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to put, before we go to the future of concrete, and I think we need to start thinking about I'm heading toward the end of this episode, um, put you on the spot a little bit. Like, we do have modern concrete, it's an amazing material. Um, what goes wrong these days with concrete, concrete installations, if anything? Anything lots. come to mind? There are, well, I mean, that's, oh, lots. that's, that's one of the, <laughs> so our business is primarily problem solving. Ah, so okay. that is, that is primarily what we do is, is look at problems with concrete and there are people many times they've, they've oh, scratched their head and said, really, there's enough of that to keep you guys busy. And believe me, there, there is, there's wow. plenty of problems. With okay. Concrete. Maybe we need to cover that in part two or chapter two or something, but give us an example or two. Well, just, uh, the, some very common examples. Um, the material doesn't perform the way you expect it to. It doesn't gain the strength that it was designed for. Huh. It, let's say that, that the structural design requires 5,000 PSI and the QC specimens indicate that it gets 4,000 PSI. So what was wrong with the concrete one? People, people are going to want to know what the answer is, is to that. So trying to understand why the concrete didn't perform the way it was expected to perform. Hmm. Um, concrete, because it's made up of a variety of different constituent materials, if any of those constituent materials don't behave the way they're supposed to behave, it will affect the performance of the concrete. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, let's say that the Portland cement, that there was a problem in the manufacturing of the Portland cement, and let's say they, they the formulation was off a little bit, and maybe the Portland cement um, set a lot quicker than what it was expected to. So now you got concrete that instead of having a, a workable life of two, two and a half hours, you only get one hour. And it gets stronger if it, as it sets slower, right? Generally, no. it, there's, there's a general rule of thumb that the faster you push the concrete for its initial strength gain, the lower its long-term strength will be versus mm. something that moves more slowly in its early strength gain has the potential of gaining a little bit higher long-term strength. But there's so many factors that go into that. that. That rule of thumb doesn't always hold true, but generally speaking, that's, that's the case. And so the way we manipulate our concrete with admixtures, with churn regimes, things like that can influence the long-term strength gain properties of the concrete. What kind of regimes? Curing. Curing regimes, okay, okay. Well, one of the th what things else? that you need to do with concrete is you want to, you want to keep it from drying out too quickly. Because mm -hmm. when the concrete, it's a sort of a race, when you place a piece of concrete, it, all concrete shrinks due to drying. As that water of convenience that we discussed, as that leaves the concrete, the concrete shrinks. And that can create, it, typically it creates some tensile stresses in the concrete due mm -hmm. to other things restraining it and keeping it from shortening. And so you want the concrete to be gaining strength such that its tensile strength is always higher than the tensile stresses that are caused by the shrinkage process. So one way to, do, to allow it to do that is to slow the shrinkage, slow the drying, right. slow the shrinkage right. so that it's gaining strength. And when it does it, when you stop curing it, basically that's what the curing process is, is you're, you're keeping it from drying out, you're letting it gain strength. And then when you stop the curing process and it does dry out, it's strong enough to resist those tensile stresses and, and it reduces the cracking. So for example, if you pour a slab on the ground, the friction between the bottom of the concrete in contact with the ground provides restraint to the shortening of that slab as it dries. Mm -hmm. As Matt says, the moisture leaves and it's just like a sponge, a wet sponge. When it dries out, what does it do? It shrinks and it curls up at the corners. Slab wants to do the same thing. If the ground is restraining that shortening, you develop tensile stresses inside of it. And there's a lot of different things that can cause points of restraint that leads to cracking. So that's you ask, what are some of the problems that go wrong with concrete? Shrinkage cracking is cracks. 
Yeah. yeah. Cracking Very for common. a variety of different reasons when and these the are not owner, just aesthetically displeasing cracks. Well, either. they could be aesthetic. They they could be structural. Um, structural. They there. It just depends. And so they reduce the durability of the concrete because water right. can get in. Because water can get in. Water and, and other materials the, and, and get to the reinforcement. And and if you're oh, if you, you rust out the reinforcement. Right. And and that's one of the questions that people ask is like, wow, we've been building concrete since the Romans, and the Pantheon is still around. And now I hear that they're over here having to replace this bridge after 25 or 30 years because it's falling apart. Well, why can't we build concrete like the Romans used to build concrete? Well, the issue is not the concrete materials. It's that we put steel in the concrete, and then we also come along and put de-icing salts oh. on the bridge. Oh. Right? So when you have those Wait, two... so the salts get through the concrete to the steel even without a crack? Even without a crack, they can permeate. If you have cracking, it Whoa. just accelerates the process. Okay. So it's, all, it's almost always the embedded... When you hear about a structure coming to the end of its service life, and our, I'm using air quotes again, our decaying infrastructure, when it comes to concrete structures, very often that has to do with corrosion. Mm. And that's a problem because as the steel corrodes, the, the volume of rust is about seven times the volume of the original steel that's being converted into rust. Whoa. Yeah, so that creates this, this expanding like thing. It's a wedge inside the concrete, and it will, it will blow the concrete apart. Wow. And cr things like chlorides that come from de-icing salts or from s contaminants like seawater or just you know, coastal structures that have salt from seawater, that drives this corrosion process and that's another big part of work that we do um, is to, to try to help owners extend the lives of structures like that. So when you hear when you hear talk about the decaying state of our infrastructure, mm -hmm. particularly as it relates to our concrete infrastructure, a large portion of that is driven by corrosion and reinforcement distress to our concrete structures. Fascinating. So testing concrete. It's fascinating to me that you're saying, okay, so you expected 5,000 PSI, you only got 4,000 PSI. Um, and then I guess you guys are, are, is one of the examples of where concrete would be brought to, to do forensics and find out what happened. Why didn't it get strong? It, I know it's got to be its own huge subject, but could you tell us a little bit about what yeah. you do, what you might do? Well, and, and let's, let's start with, with routine quality control, quality insurance testing. Um, this material is, is, is made from different constituent materials. It's made by different, different um, concrete producers. There's lots of room for mistakes to be made in the, in the process of making concrete. And, and so to monitor that and to assess the potential of that concrete to meet its expectations, um, samples will be taken generally you in the core them, you cut out a well for QCQA it's typically a cylinder that's cylinder made from the right plastic now. or the wet concrete you make cylinders oh you just pour a little bit off to the side exactly at the uh, time okay. they're placed in the concrete right I so see. you sample it you make the cylinders you let those cylinders harden age for a certain amount of time in a certain environmental condition and then you test it and see what kind of strength you get and compare it back to what your expected strengths were and so that's that's on the front end, what we call the quality control. And that control. testing happens here? We can do it, but there's there's an industry, commercial testing labs do most of that type okay, of work. Okay, you do more sophisticated. Yeah. Well, it, it's, 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 I won't necessarily say just more sophisticated, but it's after the fact. After the structure is built, a problem is identified, I now see, the concrete's I hardened. See, I see. And so, we have the ability to take samples via cores or whatever may be the case out of the concrete structures, bring them back here and do the same type of compressive strength testing to see if maybe the cylinders, the QCQA cylinders weren't done right and didn't represent the true strength in the structure. And so we can take cores and compare them and see what, the, what we call the in situ properties of the concrete are. We can also take these cores and we can cut them, polish them, look at them under microscopes and identify properties about the concrete, the, the constituents that were used, the proportions that those constituents were used in, deleterious distress mechanisms that may be going on. We can learn a lot about what's causing a problem in a concrete structure. And, and that's, that's done through a process that's referred to as concrete petrography. 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 And, and that's application of uh, microscopic skills and, and, and other uh, laboratory testing methods. 
So are you a petrographer, Matt? No, petrographers are very specialized, highly trained folks. Most of, many of them have backgrounds in geology. Huh. And so petro comes from the Greek word for stone, right? And uh, Petroleum, so, same petro? Yeah, right. Huh. But petroleum is, is stone oil. Petroleum. If you look at the, take it apart and look at the Greek words. Oh, really? Yeah. Petroleum, stone oil. Yeah. And so the, huh. the, the, the petrographers that we have, they use, uh, in many cases, they're, they're, tr they're trained as geologists, they're trained in optical meteorology so that when they're looking, they'll take the concrete, they can just look at a, a polished piece of concrete or they can make, a, they can take a little piece and, and polish it until it is super thin and light will actually come through it. Wow. And then they can use refractive properties to understand is this a piece of quartz, is it a piece of, um, you know, exactly what the minerals are in the aggregates and, and, the cement. and and they can tell you a lot about the what we call the water cement ratio that ratio of how much water there is to the cement and um, that's very important in determining the strength of the concrete and, and, and answering a question about wow. why did this concrete not get the strength it was supposed to have okay so we're about to wrap up but I have this one more topic I hear the difference uh, used a lot that there's structural concrete, which we've talked a good bit about, and then there's architectural concrete. Could one of you t touch on that? What, what does that mean with something when, when a concrete is architectural? To us, it just means that the concrete is going to be exposed to view after uh, in the finished structure. It's uh -huh. not going to get covered up by brick or by drywall or some other material. And so there's a there's a tremendous amount of variety in architectural concrete. It can be, and it really depends on the architect's vision. So some architects are looking, when you say board formed concrete, um, as you, you know, th that is a trend. I'm uh, seeing that today, a lot, yeah, right? board formed concrete. That's kind of a throwback to old school concrete before they had plywood back in the 1900s, they would form it up out of boards. And it gives you this really cool texture yeah, right. to the concrete. And so some architects are drawn to that. Some architects want concrete to look no, zero imperfections in the surface. It needs to be very smooth. Whoa. You can, and, and they want it different colors. Um, you can expose the, you can use special colored aggregates in it. You can remove some of the paste and expose those. You can polish it. Polish. I've seen that on the floors a lot. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of variety. Yeah, we have polished concrete here in our office and we have just kind of regular uh, formed concrete walls in our office. And um, you left the reinforcing are those, those are form tie holes that the form architect form. actually set the form ties in a pattern that was pleasing and was part of his vision for the concrete. Mm -hmm. And you can see the plywood. The you can see the grain of the plywood there. So there's there's a just a huge amount of, of possibilities. I think that's why architects have been drawn to concrete. Really ever since concrete appeared on the scene, architects have been looking at creative ways to use concrete um, because it is a durable material. Um, it's, it serves a structural purpose, and unlike steel, it can be molded really into any shape that they can think of. And, uh, and so you get things like the Guggenheim Museum yeah. in New York, if you've ever seen that. I mean, yeah. it, it would be, uh, you, you can only do that with concrete. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it just speaks to the versatility of the material. And, and in our world, of course, you're talking to two structural engineers. <laughs> you know, there is certainly a recognition between structural concrete and architectural concrete, such as in the precast industry. The, the precast industry is kind of divided in, in a large extent between the more structural side of precast concrete and the architectural side. Those are fairly distinct worlds that have different standards of practice. And, and the reason being is that for, as Matt said, with structural concrete quite often is not covered and you're not too worried about what it looks like. Architectural concrete is revealed and the aesthetics of it are important. And using concrete in a form where you get the right aesthetics um, takes, takes skill. Yeah. And, and, and so there is um, uh, certainly a lot to uh, the architectural concrete world. Wow. Okay, so just real quick about WJE, WJE where we are. What are you asked to do most often? Are you, are you doing structural design of concrete? Are you, do you work some with the architectural? I mean, what is it you do here? Uh, our business covers a, a <laughs> Good luck covering wide, this briefly. Yeah, I know. So uh, 
we, uh, we have a portion of our business that helps producers validate materials that they want to use in concrete. Okay. We have a portion that does assessment of concrete structures, part of that decaying infrastructure that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So we will go out and do assessments of structures and, and de design repairs for them. Um, uh, I skipped over a part, probably a part. We have a whole troubleshooting aspect of, you know, we have concrete that didn't meet strength. And so um, why didn't it meet strength? Uh, and that involves petrography. We have, uh, we have uh, projects where the concrete just starts falling apart and people don't understand what might be happening to it. So again, that's kind of on the material side. So um, there are, as we indicated, there are a lot of different things that can happen with concrete. So you have expertise broadly here. Pretty much anything to do with concrete. Right on. New design, troubleshooting, problem avoidance. Mm -hmm. So if, if architectural concrete is my wall, you know, this is the Building Science Podcast. It is also my WRB, right? It's my weather-resistant barrier. It's going to be controlling rain, air, vapor, and thermal drives. I imagine there's things that you do to the concrete to help it shed water better or not absorb water? Or does it just go in a certain distance and then dries back to the outside later? Yeah, so as an exterior enclosure, concrete panels behave as kind of a combination between a barrier and a mass wall. In, in technical terms. Uh -huh. So barrier means you're you're relying on most of the water. 99% of it is shed at the face of right the wall. Here, yeah. Right. You don't have other layers interior of that, like on a brick building where you've got a cavity and a weather barrier right. and all that. So um, you're you're generally relying on the water to be shed at the face of it. The mass the idea of a mass wall is that you may get some water absorbed into the exterior, but it doesn't come all the way to the inside and it just dries back to the outside mm -hmm. over time. And mm -hmm. so the classic example of that is old masonry walls. Yeah. You know, they, they're really thick, they have a lot of mass, um, they may absorb a little bit of water, but then they'll just slowly dry out over time. Mm -hmm. But in, in those types of situations where the concrete technology becomes really important is in the quality of the concrete that you use to make it less permeable. Right. You can make your concrete denser by uh, the, the applying um, certain techniques to have how we make our concrete. Admixtures. Admixtures, mm -hmm. um, the, mm -hmm. the, the amount of aggregate versus paste that we use, the type of binders that we use um, can, can contribute significantly to um, the density or the low porosity and hence the durability mm -hmm. of, of the concrete. Uh, and coming up with concrete that is less susceptible to cracking. Yeah. to drying or thermal shrinkage type cracking. If you've got a concrete wall, a mass concrete wall, that is your wall system or you're building, the last thing you want is, is a crack in it that goes all the way through. Mm -hmm. that, that would be very problematic. So that's where um, uh, the, the science behind understanding concrete mixtures and how to come up with mixtures to optimize them for the conditions that they're going to be used in becomes very important. Wow. So detailing the interfaces, make, avoiding cracking, mm -hmm. and then detailing the interfaces, the joints between concrete panels. Um, a very common type of construction is what we call tilt wall construction. Mm -hmm. That's what you see most warehouses and things when you see yep. that they've got concrete wall panels. Mm -hmm. um, the important thing there is making sure that the, the you know good quality concrete, minimal cracking, and then detailing the joints properly yeah. so you're not getting water in at the joints or around windows and doors and things, you know, openings in the concrete. Right. Well, this is challenging. We're getting toward the end, but the questions keep coming to me. So we'll leave mass effect on, you know, the thermal comfort and, therm and energy use for a different day. So we'll go into the future of concrete, but I will bring up that energy again because, you know, I believe it's fairly commonly known that there's a lot of embodied energy in concrete. Um, but right now we're getting toward the end. We are at the end. We're going to talk about the future of concrete. Is one of the dimensions of the future of concrete addressing the embodied energy or is that intractable as long as we use Portland or what do you think? Well it's tough to say where concrete technology is going to go. I mean as you know we were just talking about fly hmm. ash and you know you asked I mean haven't we figured concrete out? Right? Yeah. Shouldn't we know by now? It's been <laughs> 2,000 years. Yeah, right. Haven't we figured it out? Well the answer is there's always things that affect the industry, that affect the, the, the dynamics of producing this material because we make so much of it. It, it's, it is important that we understand it and we understand the implications of making it. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I don't know that we really know um, what the future will hold. Right now, we know that the way we make it is the most efficient way that we can make it. It's this material that we're dependent on. And that's, there's an economic efficiency, of course, in there. Very much so. Yes. Yeah, there's a huge economic efficiency. The yeah, industry has really... It's the main thing. Yeah, and, and the industry has a huge incentive to reduce the footprint of concrete. That energy that goes into heating those materials is a tremendous part of the cost of making Portland cement. So the industry is always looking for ways to try to become more efficient in the way that, that cement is produced. Um, and I mean, I'm a fan of capitalism and, and I believe that, you know, wherever there's an opportunity for them to be more efficient in doing that, which also helps the environment, right. I think they will do that. I can't say that I can tell you, you know, today where that's gonna lead because you just never know where the next innovation is gonna come from. The technology is changing rapidly and, and I remember thinking 15, 20 years ago that, well, gosh, there's just not much more <laughs> we can do with it yet. Um, the, the new ideas, the, 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 the new research that's coming out, um, concrete is going to be different 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now. Uh, some, of, some of the things that we're looking at right now that um, is really exciting is, is concrete, uh, what we refer to as ultra high performance concrete, which is defined to be um, roughly, depending on who you talk to, 20,000 PSI and up. Whoa. Uh, and, um, and they, we have the technology to make concrete that's 20, 30,000 PSI. Uh, and it looks a lot different than the, than the concrete that we've been talking about. It doesn't, the filler materials are extremely fine materials, um, stuff that we refer to as like silica flour. So <laughs> think about that, taking wow. silicious aggregate and pulverizing it down to like a flour consistency. And it all, it, it all kind of hinges around surface wow. area of the filler materials and the binders and, and, um, and the admixtures that are used. And, and it's the possibility the, of eliminating reinforcement. That's right. These materials, Whoa, as, really? as, as we yes. said earlier, concrete is strong in compression, weak in tension. Well, these, this class of concrete is significantly stronger in tension which opens up the opportunities wow. to use this material in a lot of different ways that we haven't been able to use concrete before without using reinforcing steel. And getting back to like, as a quick example, your architectural concrete discussion, if you have a concrete that has much higher tensile capacity, now you can make thinner shapes, which can be very architecturally oh, pleasing. Wow, you can make, you can make um, um, unique shapes that are very thin, unreinforced. As curvy as you want. Possibly. As curvy as you want, <laughs> and, 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 and that speaks to the form technology, the stuff we're using to make forms. We can make all sorts of different shapes um, for forms now and everything. Wow. So, so the, the technology is continuing to advance rapidly, and it, it's, it's very exciting to see some of the things that are, that are um, you know, coming very close to fruition for us as, as practical applications in, in the construction world. Wow, thank you guys so much. I'm afraid that's probably about all we have time for today. Huge, that was actually, just be blunt, that was more interesting than I thought it would be. That was really, really great. So thank you guys both. That's what everybody says. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my wife says. <laughs> so before we wrap up, man, we'll put this in the show notes. Matt, you have an announcement about a seminar coming up. Yeah, we're actually going to have a uh, what we call our Ask the Structure series, which is a series of seminars that we do periodically. And we have one coming up on April 12th that will be on concrete, and it's called Not Your Father's Concrete. And so that here will be, in Austin, it will we're be here in Austin. Um, we're finalizing the the uh, the uh, arrangements for it now, but I believe that we're going to put a link to our webpage in the show notes that will have more information. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you guys so much for your yes. time.